God. And let the people of God say, Amen. Amen. I welcome you to the Bread Broadcast, a weekly Bible teaching program where we exhort, edify, and challenge believers to the Great Commission. And here, we are also causing us to repentance through the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining us. Today, we are going to be talking about in the Garden of God. In the Garden of God. And our case study is going to be an unbeliever or a sinner. Now, don't tune me out. Don't shut me out yet. Stay with me. I'm not here to bash you. Uh, it's good news. It's called the gospel, the good news for a reason, okay? So we are going to be talking about all good things, beautiful things, that a sinner can actually look forward to by coming to Jesus Christ. But before we go into our lesson, let us pray. Father, we thank you. Oh, thank you for loving us so. Thank you for you have loved us with an everlasting love, regardless of our color, creed, or country. You died for all people. And Lord, even as we have brought the good news through your salvation that you brought to us over 2,000 years ago, as that good news will be sent out today, Father, we pray that it will have the right impact in the heart of the people that still need your salvation, the setting free in Jesus' name. And for us believers, we pray you use the message even to strengthen our resolve to continue to be messengers of the cross of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father Lord. For in Jesus' name, I will pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Our foundation text is going to be Romans chapter 8. We are going to read verses 31 and 32. Romans 8, 31 to 32. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Hallelujah. So who is an unbeliever, a pagan, or a sinner? And actually those are the best terms, really. If we are to really pull out the terms, some other terms, because the Bible has many names for unbelievers, uh, these are really the nice ones, okay? <laughs> so who is an unbeliever, a pagan, or a sinner? Our New King James Bible Dictionary defines a sinner as, quote, one who commits an offense against God, end of quote. So underline, underscore the, uh, the operative word, commits. So it is a continuous thing, commits. A sinner is somebody who commits sin without restraints or remorse. They are devoted to committing sin. A sinner is someone who prefers to continue sinning than to give it up and ask God for forgiveness. A sinner is an individual who is yet to have his or her sin wiped out by the blood of Jesus. A sinner is an individual who has not been indwelled by the Holy Spirit? Who doesn't carry the Holy Spirit inside of them? That individual is still a sinner. Okay? So don't say, my name is on the church roll. If you don't have the witness that the Holy Spirit lives actively in you, you're still a sinner. So you need to cry out to God. You may be a pastor, 
a deacon, a, a minister, or whatever title you choose to go by, if you can't confidently say, I know the Holy Spirit lives in me, he speaks with me, he guides me. If you cannot say that, you are still in your sin. But that can change. Amen. All right. So the story uh, that we are going to be talking about today, uh, we are going to Genesis by the way of Romans chapter 8, verses 31 to 32. That God having, give, having given us Jesus Christ, what else will he not give us? Okay? So it's the story of Adam in the book of Genesis. And in that uh, chapter 1 of the book of uh, Genesis, we saw how God created everything. And then God created Adam, the first man. And God created a garden out of Eden on the east side of Eden and put Adam in that garden. Now, Adam experienced seven things in that garden before Eve uh, came to being, before God said, uh, let us create uh, uh, an helper for, for Adam. So before Eve hit the garden and the, the story changed, um, Adam experienced seven things, benefits, that God put in that garden for Adam. And it's a metaphor of what you can expect if you turn the control of your life over to Jesus Christ. Uh, but today, we are going to do half of that, and next week, we'll finish it up. So, today is in the Garden of God, part one. I, I told you, remember, a few months back, we are not going to be rushing through Bible study on this program. It's not going to happen. So, let's see what in it for an individual who gives up a sinful life to say, Jesus I want to be your child. What do you stand to gain as benefit by becoming a child of God? What are the immediate earthly benefits that a converted soul begins to enjoy by receiving Jesus Christ apart from heavenly and eternal benefits? Okay, so right now we don't we are not even talking about what you need to look forward to in heaven. Let's start from here. What do you stand to gain by turning over your life to Jesus Christ, starting from here, right now? Number one, the first thing is accommodation. God planted a garden on the east side of Eden, and there God placed Adam. Likewise, are you following me? For you, upon receiving Jesus into your life, your eternal, your eternal address changes from hell to heaven immediately. The moment you say, Jesus, I'm tired of myself. I can keep living like this. Come be my Lord and my Savior. Guess what? God cleans up your name from the book of those going to hell and changes your name to the book, to the Lamb's book of life, to those who are going to heaven, so your eternal address changes immediately. That's the first thing. Now, God didn't make Adam look for a shelter or make Adam to build a, a shelter. No. So also, you don't need to do anything for God before God makes you a resident of heaven other than to receive Jesus. That's all you have to do. Now you have the hope to meet Jesus in heaven, just like the thief on the cross. Additionally, now let's start talking about the benefit from, from here, from earth. When you receive Jesus Christ, you come into Christ's prepared earthly shelter of internal peace, joy, Righteousness, rest. 
as his follower to help you and help us daily in our faith in a troubled world. Now, I was talking with a young man, and he is a young man, uh, a teenager really, a couple of days ago. And after we finished the one-on-one -on -one, um, discussion on cum cancer, and I just, I thought aloud, and I said, how do unbelievers survive? And he looked at me and said, no man, the question should be, how do they sleep at night? And I looked at that young man and I thought, wow, really? How do unbelievers sleep at night? Really? Because nobody is assured of tomorrow. What happens if they die in the middle of the night? They will just go to hell. You see, when you come into Jesus Christ, there's a prepared accommodation of rest in Jesus for you. You can lay your head on the pillow and sleep easy when you become a child of God. Because you will know you are at peace with God, you are at peace with yourself, and you are at peace with people around you. That doesn't mean you won't have life challenges. No. But you will have personal inner peace. Let's go to the book of John, chapter 14, verse 2. The Gospel of John, 14, 2. In my Father's house are many mansions. This is Jesus speaking to us now. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. You see, Jesus has many mansions built for his followers for us christians in heaven but before we even get to heaven he has the earthly mansions invisible mansions of his peace that he puts inside of us so that's the first accommodation that's the first thing you experience by coming to jesus to make your peace with christ is to take your place in christ to make your peace with Christ is to take your place in Christ. Moving on. The second thing that Adam encountered in the garden of God was divine provision of food. So that is called nutrition. So the first was accommodation. The second is now nutrition. And the provision of that food include the tree of the knowledge of God of good and evil. See, God gave him all kinds of fruit trees to eat. And in the midst of all that was the tree of knowledge of good and evil that he was told not to eat from. Jesus said in John 6, 51, that he is the bread from heaven and anyone who eats of this bread will live forever. Not only that believers have access to the word of God as our daily bread to give us the spiritual energy that we need to resist the temptations of each day. The word of God also makes us stand firm in times of trials. Those are two things, okay? Temptations and trials, they are different. Temptation is when the devil is suggesting to you to do something wrong. You can steal. Nobody is watching. You are just by yourself. Come on. That is temptation. Now, if you don't have the spirit of God in you, if you don't have the divine nutrition, the word of God, guess what? You won't be able to resist the devil. Oh, no. You just go for it. But when you have the Spirit of God in you and the Word of God, then you, have, you will be given the power to say no. The power to say no to the devil comes from the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Now, trial is trial of our faith. It's something that you don't have control over. It's not a uh, wrong. No, it's not immoral. Uh, and it's biblically correct, correct. For example, you have gone for all kinds of interviews. 
you are waiting for a phone call that you got the job uh, you feel that God knows how many number of applications job applications there's nothing you can do except to just wait and pray that one job will come through and they will call you now while you're waiting and praying and hoping that is the trial of your faith okay so it's not something to do wrong. No. You are just hoping for God to move to give you your desired uh, expectation. Okay? So the word of God as divine nutrition gives us the energy, gives us the strength to say no to temptations from the devil and gives us the energy to stand firm while we are hoping and waiting for God to uh, deliver us or to do a miracle that we believe we believe in him for also the word of God opens our spiritual eyes to know what God desires in us and to discern between good and evil I tell people before I became a child of God I didn't have problem lying oh no as far as I was concerned I was being smart I was covering my back but then I became a child of God and mm, 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 I can't because the Holy Spirit will not allow me to say that and the Word of God that I eat every day has made me realize that is a lie is not being smart you see that is the tree of knowledge of, of, of knowing good and evil through the Word of God I was able to discern this is not smartness this is called lie you see so through the word of God we are able to discern between good and evil and to know what God desires in us and by doing this it helps us to avoid breaking the hedge of protection that God has put around us believe it or not if you are a child of God you are divinely protected you are and to break that is to let the devil come in to afflict or attack you you see but through the word of god we know not to do anything that will break that hedge psalm 1 verse 1 the book of psalms chapter 1 verse 1 uh, our senior pastor has said every christian should know this by heart i'm working on it blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. You see, it's through the word of God that you know how not to take the counsel of the ungodly, how not to stand with sinners, and how not to sit with those who scorn or scoff at the word of God. That is how you know is divine nutrition. To study God's word is to study your world and study your word. Let me say that again. So beautiful. To study God's word is to study your world and study your word. Moving on. The third feature uh, was irrigation in the garden where God put Adam. There was a river from Eden and this river watered the garden on the east side where God put Adam. In the New Testament, water or river is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. At salvation, the Holy Spirit comes from God into our lives, just like the river that came from Eden into the East Garden where God put Adam. And the Holy Spirit comes into our heart as an eternal, eternal, not temporary, assurance of God's ownership of our soul. I was going to church before I became a child of God. I was in the choir, I was in the prayer group and all that. 
But all that time, I was just going because my mama said, you got to go to church. I didn't have the Holy Spirit. Amen. But when I became a child of God, the Holy Spirit came into my heart. And I knew at that point that come what may, I'm heavenward bound, you see. So how did, how did I know? Because the assurance came in the person and the presence of the Holy Spirit into my life. Also, the Holy Spirit keeps us going in our faith walk and refreshes us as we go through a faith journey. I totally surrender my life to Jesus at the age of 30 and I'm, I'm, now I'm in my mid-40s. How have I been able to keep on keeping on? It's not because I know how to walk in God or I know how to pray or fast. No! It's the Holy Spirit that gets me up every day, refreshes me and strengthens me. When I go to the Word of God, it shows me what I need to see for that day. And that's how I'm able to walk every day. And it's the same story for people who have known God for... I, I, was, I was watching Pastor Charles Stanley yesterday. This man of God has been walking with God for over 60 years. You see, something is keeping him going. And it's not his, his, his ability to pray or fast. No, but that's something, people call it something, but he's someone to us. He's a person. Is the Holy Spirit. Amen. Genuine believers are able to continue steadfastly in their faith until death, not by might, not by power, the word of God says, but by the Spirit of God. God himself said, not by power, not by might, but by my Spirit, said the Lord of hosts. You see, so when you come into Jesus Christ, there is divine spiritual irrigation through the person of the Holy Spirit, it keeps watering your garden every day and you are able to continue in your faith walk. The Holy Spirit retains and maintains believers in our faith race. Let me back up and say that again. I love the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit retains and maintains believers in our faith race. Let's read the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verse 25. Jeremiah 31, 25. For I satisfy the thirsty person and feed all those who are weak. You see, that is the work of the Holy Spirit. He satisfies us, our thirst, and he feeds us so we are not weak. So he, he retains and maintains believers in our faith race. I kind of switch that, uh, but that's okay. So what have we done today so far? Who is an unbeliever? A pagan or a sinner? A sinner is an individual who sins continually without restraint or remorse. A sinner is an individual who would rather continue living in sin than give it up for God's forgiveness. A sinner is someone whose sin is not yet wiped out by the blood of Jesus. And a sinner, of course, is someone who does not have the Holy Spirit inside of them. So what do you benefit as a sinner if you give your life to Jesus from being a sinner to becoming a saint. A saint is not only those who died in Christ Jesus. I'm a saint. Does that mean I'm perfect? No. But the Holy Spirit is in me. So I'm a child of God. Okay? So it cleanses me every day. And that makes me a saint. So what do you benefit by coming to Jesus? Number one, accommodation. Just as God brought Adam into a prepared garden, God writes your name as one of his own in heaven and gives you a spot in heaven. God also brings you his inner peace to live in a challenging world. Nutrition. 
As God provided fruit trees in the garden for Adam as food, so God readily makes his word available and accessible to feed you. And just as there was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the midst of the garden, so also the word of God teaches you to discern between good and evil. Irrigation. A river came from Eden to water the garden for Adam on the east side. The same way the Holy Spirit comes into your heart, if you give your heart to Jesus, from God, the Holy Spirit comes from God, from Jesus into your heart to dwell there as a sign of God's ownership of your life. And also, He energizes you in your faith walk. So we've done three today. Next week, if the Lord tarries, we will finish it up, okay? So let's conclude this way. Are you a believer? How do you invest the spiritual bread and water with which the Holy Spirit feeds you every day? Huh? How do you invest it? It's not just for you to feed on every day and sit on. No, you have to pass it on. Whatever the Holy Spirit has fed you with, you need to pass it on to people because that's divine investment in you and God is waiting for your return. Okay? The Holy Spirit taught me this topic during the week too and now I'm teaching you. That's the way it should be. Okay? A day is coming that you will give account and I will give account of every investment God has put in my life and he has put in your life. We are all going to give account. If you have not been faithful with what God has entrusted into your hands, it's never too late. Start today, right now. Amen. Now, if you are not yet a believer and you are wondering, what is this salvation thing all about? It's about the benefits you stand to gain in this world and eternity. Feel free to rewind this video and listen to the benefits again. The second part, we'll finish it next week, okay? The Holy Spirit guides, protects, and empowers believers to walk in faith. So you are not alone when you come to Jesus. He gives you a companion. His name is called the Holy Spirit, you see? If there were no benefits, please listen up close. If there were no benefits in Christ Jesus, why would there have been such persecutions and numerous attacks against Christianity in the world? Huh? Think about it. It's commonsensical, right? It's logical. If there were no good things in Christ Jesus, if there were no benefits in Christ Jesus, think about it. Why would ISIS be chasing Christians in the Middle East, chopping off their heads? Huh? Why would they be killing Christians all over the world if there were no benefits in Christ Jesus? Think about that. Because I know you are intelligent enough to come to a logical conclusion about this salvation and Jesus Christ. If you are ready and you are saying, you know what? It makes sense. I'm not even going to wait until next week I want to sign up for these benefits in Christ Jesus right now. Listen, I am so glad. You just made God smile. If that's your decision right now, wait. I'm going to say a brief prayer. And after that, a link is coming up. Please click on that link and go to where that link takes you. There we will meet you. And we have broken down what salvation means and how to become saved. We're not going to ask you for anything. Salvation is free. You don't pay anything. Uh-uh. Okay? So let's pray so you can uh, click on that link. Okay? Father, we thank you. Thank you for your word that has come out. Oh, Lord, as for those whose hearts have been stirred up to become saved, Father, I pray as they go to that link, meet with them. Make your word comprehensible to them. And for us believers, I pray, O oh Lord, that you continue 
to challenge us to this great commission every day we wake up. Thank you, Father Lord. For in Jesus' name, I'll be praying. Amen and amen. Like I said, we are going to finish this next week, but share this with everyone you know, all right? So I will see you next week if Jesus has not split the sky open.